did I do it or did I do something different? Did I go with the urge or not? And that's a big thing as well is noticing that separation between urge and action that you might have the urge to do something, but you might choose to do something different. A psychiatrist would work from a, um, a sort of medical perspective. So they'll often work with kind of lists of symptoms and they're trying to find a, a suitable label that, you know, for that cluster of symptoms and then medicate. Whereas psychologists work with the individual. So it's very much, we will formulate a situation. So um, I remember actually when I was training and I was I was apologising to my supervisor saying, sorry, this formulation is really messy. And, and she just said, life is messy. So if your formulation isn't messy, you've missed something. And, and you really kind of map out with someone the cycles that they're stuck in and what's going on. And that's such a, a massive theme is, you know, someone will come along and say, I, I'm doing these things. I don't know why I'm doing these things, but I can't stop doing them. And I know it's having a detrimental effect on my life. Whatever that thing is, the yeah. detail changes, but generally that theme is really consistent. Um, and so you sort of map out, okay, this happens, you feel this, and then you do this. And you think that about yourself, so then you do more of that or less of that. And, and, and you can kind of start to see these cycles. And there's such benefit in doing that because you get to have this sort of bird's eye view on your own life. You're like, oh, that's what I'm doing. And it doesn't change anything instantly, but you then, you get this sort of awareness in hindsight. So you'll go to therapy and say, yeah, I did that last week and then I did that. Da, da, da. And then over time, when you repeat that, you start to get that awareness in the moment as you're going around the cycle. You go, oh, I know where I am in the cycle. And that sort of opens up this opportunity to choose. Okay, I know I'm feeling this and I know I have the urge to do that. I can either go with it or I can take the exit. And I know from previously talking about it in therapy, what the other direction is I could go in. So is are there stages on that cycle you could talk us through that a listener could maybe self-diagnose themselves? Um, not so much because they're sort of individually based. So it's always, um, I think, um, something I talk about in the book about sort of being able to play around with formulation yourself is really, uh, you can you can do that through journaling, really. You can look at, okay, um, let's keep a thought diary and a mood diary and, a, you know, what happened. You can do it with positive moments as well as negative ones, right? So yeah. you can look at, this happened, I noticed I felt X emotion and these were the thoughts going through my head. And then I had this urge to do X, Y, Z. Did I do it or did I do something different? Did I go with the urge or not? And that's a big thing as well is noticing that separation between urge and action that you might have the urge to do something, but you might choose to do something different um, or you might just impulsively go with it. Um, and then, you know, whatever you did will have another consequence emotionally. So often the sort of, the things that people are doing are having an emotional payoff in some way because they're relieving distress or something in the short term. Yeah. Can you explain about unmet needs and whether this kind of ties into everything that we're talking about here? Mm. Um, so when I talk about unmet needs, I'm really talking about those basic human needs for uh, love and belonging um, and safety, you know, psychological safety and those sorts of things that are in us and they're not going anywhere. And but but modern life isn't necessarily set up for those to happen all of the time or be met those needs to be met. Um, and also, you know, you don't get to choose what family you're born into. So sometimes, well, all the time, it is imperfect, right? And um, and so, I think when you then get into adulthood, it's really helpful to look back at unmet needs because it informs what you're doing now. Um, and and often, you know, if if a key need was not met in your childhood, um, I'm trying to think of an example, um, you know, that need for a sense of belonging, for example, maybe you felt left out or rejected from your family or something. That feeling is not going to disappear just because you've moved out of home. It will then pop up in your relationships. And, and then you'll have these safety behaviours, probably ones that kept you safe when you were younger and worked when you were younger in an environment where you were dependent. But in an adult relationship, they no longer work, right? And they just cause yeah. problems in your relationship. And so, you know, we can then really get down on ourselves about what we're doing and why am I doing that? I'm a relationship and I'm ruining everything. And actually, if we look at that with curiosity, we get to see that there's this, this need under there that causes that really strong urge to, I don't know, be controlling to a partner or um, 
cheat or do these things that cause destruction, there's usually something under there that has led to that urge to happen. Um, so it can be really... And then once you understand where that urge is coming from, you get more choice whether you act on it or not. So if there was anybody listening to this then that was thinking, I'd like to go and excavate my childhood just to find out what are the needs that maybe drive some of these impulses today. Mm. The obvious first step is to come and speak to somebody like yourself, an expert on it, but if they don't have access to that or maybe they're not sure of how to do it, what kind of questions can we be asking ourselves that we could start this process? I think start with just, I mean, you don't want to kind of rush into stuff if if you know that there's really painful things that actually you've been avoiding or pushing away for a reason because it's too overwhelming and you're not sure um not sure that you can kind of manage that um then take it slow for sure um and only do it if you have safe ways to manage painful emotion so there are lots of people out there that don't and and so then you know risky or unhealthy behaviors will pop up as soon as you go there a therapist would never ask you to talk about in-depth um trauma experiences without first making sure that you have the tools to cope with the painful emotion that's going to come up right okay. it's overwhelming there's a reason we got all these you know numbing behaviors that just make it go away and it's because it's overwhelming so they'll often teach you the skills first to manage difficult emotion and then you're more equipped to go with it and um, so give us some examples and julia of what what some of those skills are to cope with it oh wow so um that's all the stuff that's in the book really and that and that's really why i wanted to to even write it in the first place was I noticed that, you know, in therapy, a lot of what people were struggling with was having no tools to deal with very yeah. human experiences. And um, I didn't see why people just have to pay to come see people like me to find out basic stuff about how their own mind works and how they could impact on their mood or relationships, that kind of stuff. Um, so I've put it all in the book. There's lots in there. Um but it's all based on, you know, different situations. So depending on what you're struggling with, the tool you use will be different. Um, and so, there, you know, but we, the, I think the key is that we have this arsenal of tools to yep. pick up on for how difficult it is to be human at times. Um, we don't have to feel like we're at the mercy of emotional experience. Um, we just have to knuckle down and learn learn a few tools, practice them like mad, um, and then they will come up as helpful later on. When you find yourself in a position, you start using that tool, and then you go, oh, yes, that was a bit easier than it was before, a year ago or whenever. So, um, yeah, there are lots depending on what your situation is. I really like it when you talk about making a good enough decision mm. because I think, and you know, again... For some people, this podcast plays into the search for perfection. You know, you have to make the perfect decision. Actually, a good enough decision, as you explain, is often good enough. Yeah, and perfectionism is... It's interesting, isn't it, the way people talk about perfectionism as if it's like a... You know, you'll often say it in an interview, I'm a perfectionist, so, you know, employ me, I'll do really well. And actually, um, it's... I think um, it's been described by lots of therapists as like a 10-ton shield where um, it makes you feel like you're safe, um, but actually it stops you from being yourself and being free to take risks. And it's paralyzing for a lot of people. So a lot of people who, you know, are perfectionists will decide not to take that risk because in the face of failure, they can't they can't treat themselves with kindness or respect. Mm. They're going to, going to tip into absolute self-loathing and, and it's that absolute intolerance of imperfection um, that, that makes it incredibly difficult to, to the, take the risks that you need for something like high performance. You know, high performance and perfectionism um, are, are enemies, really. You know, you Correct. can't... It's only through... I mean, even doing this stuff for me... Um, I had to let go of any ideas of perfectionism in order to even be able to do it, right? Explain that. Um, because you're vulnerable, you're out there. I mean, even yeah. here, right? I could say the wrong thing. It could go everywhere. It could, you know, um, there's always that risk. You're vulnerable. And I think for me personally, and this is in the book as well, is that the only way truly that I've been able to do that, the most valuable tool that I've had all the way along, is the 
a 100% commitment to myself that in the face of failure, when I fall and when it all goes wrong and I humiliate myself on live TV or whatever, that I'll have my own back and I will treat myself with the absolute respect and compassion that my own personal coach would. 